Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog and that's just a domestic dog, not a raccoon dog. Now, over the last few weeks, there's been quite a bit in the news about the origins of COVID. First, there was a new report from the US Department of Energy, which said they had low confidence intelligence that it came from a lab. Then the US Senate launched an inquiry where they interviewed a few people with no experience in either coronaviruses or emergency viruses who were sure that it came from a lab. And finally, some new data was released that showed that some of the samples found at the Huanan seafood market that were positive for SARS-CoV-2 were also positive for DNA of animals that are known to be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. So in this video, we'll have a look at all this new evidence and we'll start with the new data regarding the samples from the Huanan market. And there's a bit of a backstory to this data that goes back over a year. This preprint was posted on Research Square on the 25th of February 2022. And it's a study looking at the presence of SARS CoV 2 in samples taken from the 1N market in January 2020. The authors found SARS CoV 2 virus in a number of samples taken from the market, but they didn't find it in any of the animal swabs that they took. However, it's important to note that they didn't swab any of the species of animals known to be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 that have been shown to be present at the market at the time the outbreak is believed to have occurred. They also showed that there was a correlation between samples that contain SARS-CoV-2 and samples that had human genetic material. And this, of course, makes perfect sense because we know that there were a number of people at the market who were infected with SARS-CoV-2. However, if we look a bit more closely at figure A, we see that although it is clear that SARS-CoV-2 correlates with human genetic material, it also correlates with some other genetic material that the authors haven't identified. The authors have marked SARS-CoV-2 and Homo sapiens in red, but there is another grey dot right next to the Homo sapiens red dot. So what genetic material constituted the various grey dots? Well, for ages we didn't know because the authors hadn't released their data. But then suddenly some of it was released on the Gizaid database. It was then subsequently removed and all sorts of argy-bargy ensued which I won't go into. Importantly, though, scientists were able to download the data and analyse it. 19 virologists from six countries were involved in the analysis and their findings have been written up as a report, which is published on Zenodo. So what did they find? A number of samples that were positive for SARS-CoV-2 were also positive for mitochondrial DNA from a number of mammals that are known to be susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, including the common raccoon dog, Malayan porcupine, armour hedgehog, musk palm civet and hoary bamboo rat. And these samples were also taken from the area of the market that had the highest density of positive SARS-CoV-2 samples. Importantly, in some samples that were positive for SARS-CoV-2, they found genetic material from animals, in particular raccoon dogs, but only minimal material from humans. Now, of course, this doesn't prove that there was an infected animal there or that even if there was, that animal was the source of the infection, but it is consistent with a zoonotic spillover. And it adds to the other evidence that already points to a zoonotic spillover, including the fact that there is nothing in the virus that suggests it was manipulated in a lab. The fact that analysis shows early cases were centred around the one and market, even though it's not a particularly busy place compared with many other venues in Wuhan. And the fact that analysis shows there were at least two 
separate cross-species transmission events into humans as opposed to our mutation in humans following one initial spillover. And if you want more details on this evidence, I have covered it in a previous video, which I will provide a link to in this video's description. More importantly, though, this new analysis destroys one of the many claims made by lab leak proponents to bolster their case. Many lab leakers point to the fact that the virus was only found in samples of human genetic material as evidence that the outbreak didn't start at the market. We now know that this assertion was false. Similarly, lab leakers like to point to the fact that no animal samples from the market tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 as further evidence in support of their case. We now know definitively that there were SARS-CoV-2 susceptible species of animals at the market that were not included in the animals tested. So it's hardly surprising that no animals tested positive. Oh, and by the way, the reason I'm referring to lab leak proponents as lab leakers is just because it's shorter and easier to say. It's not meant to be derogatory. If you think it is, get over yourself. So that was a new evidence that has recently been uncovered that supports the zoonotic spillover theory. Let's now have a look at the evidence for a lab leak. Here it is. If you're wondering why you can't see anything on this page, it's not a mistake. It's because there isn't anything on it. Because there is no evidence. Now, I'm sure right now there are a bunch of people shouting at the screen and hammering on their keyboards that I am wrong because they have seen a video or read a sub stack or tweet thread showing the evidence. Or maybe they read a preprint or a paper in a dodgy predatory journal that claim to provide evidence. And for those of you who don't know what a predatory journal is, it's a journal that prioritises profits over science and publishes papers that haven't undergone proper peer review for a fee. And the most prolific publisher of these types of journals is MDPI. This doesn't mean that every paper published in an MDPI journal is dodgy, but they do definitely publish a lot of rubbish. Now, the thing is, you read these things and they sound pretty sciencey and convincing, but unless you have expertise in virology, it's impossible to know whether what they are saying is legit or just bollocks. Sometimes the claims made by these people are so obviously wrong that even I can work out they are talking bollocks, but sometimes you need someone who is a domain expert to point out the flaws. And I'll just give you a few examples. After the report that I covered came out, a number of lab leakers rushed to discredit it on Twitter. Alex Washburn, for instance, said the following, How's that for misleading? The metagenomic sample broadcast to show massive amounts of raccoon dog DNA, dot, 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 didn't have any SARS-CoV-2 in it. And a large number of people just accepted that Dr. Washburn was right. But he wasn't. The sample was PCR negative, but it was positive when using next generation sequencing, which means it did contain SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And here is another one, this time from Elena Chan. Another serious case of the proximal origin authors not carefully reading the method section of the Chinese CDC's paper, whose data they used in their hashtag origin of COVID analysis. Samples were processed in a way such that human genetic material was removed. Now, if Dr. Chan had a bit more expertise, she would know that it is not possible to just selectively remove human genetic material. There are kits that allow you to remove mammalian RNA, but not specifically human RNA. But they were just tweets. This is a full-blown preprint. The authors claim to have found an endonuclease fingerprint that indicates that SARS-CoV-2 had a synthetic origin. 
and they provide lots of sciencey sounding detail that they claim supports this finding. Here's the thing though, it's total bollocks. The things that they put forward as being a synthetic fingerprint have all been shown to occur naturally in other coronaviruses. And this paper here, which was published in a proper peer-reviewed journal, provides further details on why their analysis is wrong. Now, if you would like a more layman-friendly explanation of why the preprint is bollocks, Dr. Sam Gregson, aka the bad boy of science, has made a great video that goes through all the flaws in the preprint. And as an added bonus, he has a much more pleasant voice than me and doesn't wave his hands around. Now, not all lab leakers go to the trouble of writing complex, dodgy papers. A lot of the arguments put forward are a lot more simplistic. So I will go through some of them now. I won't cover all of them because there are just too many. After all, it's pretty easy to make up lies, so there's no limit on how many you can make up. And of course, a lot of arguments involve conspiracies because of course they do. And here's one. All the scientists in the world are part of a huge conspiracy to hide the lab leak so they can keep doing gain of function research. Yes. All scientists are evil except for a few plucky scientists who are exposing them, who are as pure as the driven snow. The key problem with this conspiracy is that the majority of scientists who are doing research into viral origins aren't doing gain-of-function research. And it's also important to know that gain-of-function research isn't the bill and its detractors like to make it out to be. This table here shows some of the breakthroughs that have been made possible thanks to gain-of-function research. Closely related to the crazy claim that all scientists are part of a huge conspiracy to hide the truth is the following claim. There is a conspiracy amongst all scientific journals not to publish anything that opposes natural origins for SARS-CoV-2. This one is very easy to disprove because this letter to the editor was published in Science in May 2021, calling for both hypotheses regarding the origin of COVID-19 to be investigated fully. I guess the scientists who put their names to the letter also didn't get the memo that they were supposed to be covering up the lab leak. It's also worth noting that one of the scientists that signed this letter, Michael Warraby, did continue to investigate both hypotheses and came to the conclusion that the lab leak hypothesis was implausible. Of course, if you write a completely nonsense paper claiming to have evidence that SARS-CoV-2 was created in a lab when you don't, that isn't going to get published in a reputable journal. That's not a conspiracy though. It's just how scientific publishing is supposed to work. And then there is this. It's a huge coincidence that SARS-CoV-2 emerged in a city where there was a lab studying coronaviruses. Now, before we talk about the SARS-CoV-2 coincidence, I would like to tell you about another suspicious coincidence. In 2013, there was an outbreak of a dangerous bacterial pathogen known as Pseudomonas aeruginosa at a hospital in Sydney. Well, it just so happens that our lab, which is also in Sydney, was working with the same pathogen. And here's some pictures that I took as proof. What are the chances of the outbreak occurring in the same city as a lab that was working on the pathogen? The chances are in fact very high because Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a who priority pathogen. So there's a large number of labs all over the world working on it. And I can say absolutely that we had nothing to do with it because the outbreak was a different strain. The source was traced to a contaminated sink. Well, it turns out that it's pretty similar when it comes to coronaviruses. Although people like to talk about the Wuhan Institute of Virology studying coronaviruses as something unique, 
This picture here, which was put together by Michael Warraby, shows that there's lots of cities in China where there were labs doing coronavirus research. Given you require a populated area like a city for an outbreak to take hold, it's not that much of a coincidence that it happened in one of the many cities that was studying coronaviruses. And if you want to talk about coincidences, it's a bit of a coincidence that in a city of 11 million people with thousands of meeting places, the epicentre of the outbreak was at one of the only four markets selling wildlife. Here's another common lab leaker claim. SARS-CoV-2 was already pre-adapted to humans, which means it must have been designed in a lab. This one is totally ridiculous because SARS-CoV-2 isn't pre-adapted to humans. It's a generalist virus that infects lots of animals. And then, of course, we have the furin cleavage site nonsense. A grant proposal that mentioned the Wuhan Institute of Virology also mentioned furin cleavage sites, and SARS-CoV-2 has one. Where do I start? The grant wasn't funded. The grant proposed work on the furin cleavage site to be done at the University of North Carolina in the US, not the Wuhan Institute of Technology. And the furin cleavage site that was in the original Wuhan virus was a pretty crappy one that no one in their right mind would have designed. And finding a furin cleavage site in SARS-CoV-2 is hardly a big deal. They occur naturally in a lot of coronaviruses, as well as other viruses. But what about the report from the Department of Defence that said they had low confidence intelligence that SARS-CoV-2 came from a lab? Let's ignore the fact that it was low confidence, but what about it? Well, it's important to know that eight agencies looked at COVID origins. Two thought lab leak was more likely, four thought natural source was more likely, and two were undecided. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there were also a number of crazy claims made at a recent US Senate hearing. Dr. Dan Wilson from Debunk the Funk fame has already made a video debunking them. So I'll just provide a link to his video instead of reinventing the wheel. So in summary, lab leakers make lots of sciencey sounding claims to support their conspiracy. But when you look into them, you find that although they sound sciencey, they are not actually science. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we know 100% that the SARS-CoV-2 didn't somehow escape from a lab, but at the moment there is definitely no evidence that supports it. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. I've also included links to the videos that I've mentioned, as well as a bunch of other videos that have interviews with some of the scientists who are doing work on COVID oranges. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.